Oh 
never lets go. His faithfulness. He's so faithful, so faithful to hang on there, trust that he never lets go. In this next song, we're going to sing, it talks about that sometimes in this life we find ourselves yearning and searching for something that the world is not satisfying. The world's just not satisfying. Um, but we have a promise in Scripture from Revelation 22, verse 17, that says to, to come, to drink of the living water. Those who are thirsty, to drink of the living water without payment for free. Well, Jesus Christ is a living water, the spring of life. He is the drink that satisfies. So in our life, when we've ser we're searching and we're yearning, we're trying to, to, to quench a thirst that the world is not satisfying. Go to Jesus. Turn to Jesus. You will drink no more. You will search no more. Because he will quench the thirst that we sometimes try to quench with things of this world. And we keep coming up empty. Jesus is living water in the spring of life. And that's what we're going to sing about.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you were here last weekend as we were in chapter number 21, you know that we began thinking about these final two and wonderful chapters of the book of Revelation. We were so encouraged uh, last week as we were thinking about the promise of verse number 5. Would you look there again, chapter 21 and verse number 5, where Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. And we were so encouraged last week to think about the new things that Jesus not only has done in the past, the new things that he's made in the past, but the promises of new things that are revealed to us in chapters number 21 and 22. We, we began by talking last weekend about the new creation that's promised. He says in verse number 1 that there's a new heaven and a new earth because the old heaven, the first heaven, the first earth are passed away. Uh, we talked about the fact that in that new heaven and new earth, in that new creation, that there will be a new capital city. Uh, we discovered the truths last week of the new Jerusalem, that wonderful new Jerusalem descending down from God out of heaven, the capital city of that eternal uh, heaven. We talked about the new community, how that there will be this day when all of the saints will be gathered in. From every nation under heaven, we will live in perfect fellowship with every person who has ever come to know Christ under, under heaven. So from, from every language group, every people group, every race, joined together in one saved community in the presence of God. We talked about the glorious promise of verse number 4. If you look at chapter 21, verse 4, when he says, The former things will pass away. And you'll remember that we talked about the fact that this is the new condition. He says that there will be no more death, nor pain, nor sorrow, nor crying, for the former things are passed away. So there's a new creation with a new capital, living in a new community where we will have a new condition, a life with no pain or suffering. And then last week we talked about the new communion. That the Bible says in verse number 22 of chapter 21 that there is no temple in heaven, and there's no temple because we don't need a temple where we will meet with God because we will be with God. I think it's verse number 2 of chapter 21 that says that he will be with his people and they will be with him and we will dwell with him forever. All of these are the new things, a new creation, new capital, new community, new communion, new, new condition. I said to you last weekend, I want to reemphasize it to you today, that you should not misunderstand that when the Bible says that God is going to do these new things, that he is not having a brainstorm. God is not having a new idea. In other words, it's not that these things are new in concept. Like God goes, I never thought of that before. Why don't we do it like this, this time? It's not a new concept. It's new in our experience. What he's saying to us is that you, because of sin and fallenness, your separation from me, you have never experienced experienced what you're getting ready to experience. So the reality of the new things of chapters 21 and 22 is in fact the experience of what God always and forever has intended for us, what we were created to enjoy, but sin and Satan robbed us of it, and the promise of revelation is that he is going to restore us to paradise, that paradise is going to be regained. So here's what you discover at the end of the Bible, at the end of the book of Revelation. It is that when you close your Bible, you come to that final page of Scripture, and you close it, and you close your Bible, and you say, okay, I've come to the end. Then here's what you discover, that the Bible ends exactly where it began. That what was the original creation in all of its glory was robbed from us and yet, because God loves us so much, He plunged into our lostness and He restores it for us. And so when you get to the end, what was here is in fact there. The Bible ends exactly where it began. And so from Genesis to Revelation, from the beginning in glory and perfection to where it ends in glory and perfection... What you have between those two, from Genesis to Revelation, is the biblical narrative of man's sin, of man's rebellion, and of God's redemption to restore for us everything that was lost. So today you come to the end. Today you come to the conclusion, not just of the book of Revelation, 
you come to the conclusion of your Bible. The words that we will read today are the final words of God in his revelation to man. They are the final sentences of Jesus Christ. These are the final lights of revelation. And so you follow along. I'm going to pick up the text in verse number 12, chapter 22, and verse number 12. That verse says, And behold, Jesus is speaking, And behold, I am coming quickly. I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega. We talked about that last week. I am the A to the Z. I am the beginning and the end. I am the first and the last. I am the bookends of every event in history and every circumstance in life. I am the originator of all things, and I will conclude all things. I start everything. I tie a bow on all of it when it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, and they, uh, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loves and makes a lie. I, Jesus... If you're a note taker, would you underline those two words, please? I, Jesus. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and the morning star. Two identifiers. That's an important verse. We're going to come back to it. Verse 17, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of these prophecies, uh, the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now let me stop right there and have you look up here. If you remember, if you've been with us through this whole study, we've seen some horrible plagues that have been revealed. Well, we don't want any part of that. Amen? So he says, if you add to this, then to to you will be added the plagues of this book. In verse 19, And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written therein. Now, sometimes that verse gives people some concern about the possibility of losing your salvation. Let me just kind of put these two together and help you understand. He simply is saying that this prophecy, this final book of the Bible, as I mentioned, is the conclusion of all the things that we've learned. It brings everything to its conclusion. And he's simply saying to add to or to subtract from this revelation is to reject this revelation as it has been given. And if you reject the Word of God and you reject Christ, then all of the plagues described herein are yours. And the hope that comes with being in the book of life is not yours. It is the idea that we receive the truth of God as it is, and we respond to it in faith. Verse number 20 then says, He which testifieth these things says, red letters again, Jesus speaking, Surely I come quickly. And John said, Amen. Loved ones, it is biblical to say amen when truth is declared. So if I say from God's Word something true, you say, so you were just so biblical just then. So Jesus said, behold, or surely I come quickly. Would you say it? And And John then says, even so come, Lord Jesus. I like that idea. We're ready for you to come again. And then verse number 21, the concluding verse of the Word of God, may the grace, what a benediction it is, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And again, let's say it, amen. Well, I want us to think about this final book of the Bible, final chapter of the final book of the Bible, by understanding some key points in it. Many of you are note takers, and I want you to write down to begin with that this passage reveals for us I don't know a better way to say it than this. It reveals for us the champion of revelation. The champion 
of Revelation. I love the fact, and, and I had you underline in verse number 16, these two words, I, Jesus. I love the fact that chapter number 22 of Revelation, the whole book to be sure, but certainly in chapter 22 for today, that this book ends by declaring without obscurity, with no question at all, that the champion, not just of the book of Revelation, but really the champion of the ages is Jesus himself. When verse 16 says, I, Jesus, have testified these things, I, Jesus, am the root and the offspring of David. He's saying, I'm the fulfillment of prophecy. And he said, I'm the bright and the morning star. He's simply saying, I'm the champion. I'm the one who is bringing into your darkness and into the darkness of this world the light and the hope of a new morning. And then I love that the chapter ends with Jesus' declaration, I am coming quickly, and then this wonderful benediction of the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Now you need to understand that the clarity of chapter number 22 in terms of who is the champion of the ages, the clarity of seeing Jesus in chapter 22 is, has not always been the case. There has earlier in the biblical text been a lot of mystery as to who the champion would be. In fact, I want you to hold your finger in Revelation and go all the way back to the book of Genesis. And so you'll find that very quickly because it's the first book of the Bible. So you go right to the front cover. And look with me in Genesis chapter number 3 and think with me for just a minute about the moment in which the human family fell into sin. If you can, if you can think about the moment when Eve partook of that fruit and Adam partook with her and the human family was plunged into darkness and sin and death, that followed a season of absolute perfection and glory. Perfect holiness in fellowship and communion with God. Now, we don't know exactly how long that Adam and Eve had in perfect union before the fall occurred. But there was a season, however long it was, when they were in perfect union. God walked with them in the cool of the day. They enjoyed his presence and his fellowship. They were totally innocent. They had no sin or broken relationship between the two of them or between uh, them and God. They were living in this perfect garden in perfect innocence with a perfect God in absolute glory. Until Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the Bible says that the serpent was more subtle, more deceptive than any beast of the field which God had made. And in verse number 1, the enemy, Satan, begins to enter into the scene and to bring deception. The very first thing that he does is he says to Eve, half God said. He begins to question, to cast doubt on the word of God. Has God said that you can't eat of every tree of the garden? She says, well, we can eat of the trees, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil we can't eat. And God said, don't eat it because if we do, we'll die. And then he begins to call God a liar. You will not die. God's lying to you. God doesn't want you to know what he knows. And he's not being fair to you. And you need to partake of that fruit. So The Bible says in verse number 6 that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and that it was a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit, she did eat of the fruit, and then she gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And I want you to listen. In that moment, instantaneously, Adam and Eve, and as a result, all of their descendants, the human family, was plunged into the darkness of separation from God. Sin entered in the world, and that perfect communion with God was broken. Literally, what God said would happen did happen. Adam and Eve died, not physically, but they died spiritually. Well, when you read the rest of chapter number 3, you discover that God comes into the garden and he begins to deal with their sin. And if you'll look with me in chapter number 3 and verse number 15, God, speaking to the serpent, speaking to Satan, says in verse number 15 something very hopeful but very mysterious. Verse number 15, God says, I will put enmity or division or hatred between you, speaking to the, to, to the serpent, to the Satan, between you and the woman, the woman that you have deceived, the woman who first partook of the fruit, 
The woman that you have gotten won over on. The woman that you convinced to do what she was commanded not to do. He says, God says to Satan, I will do something in the future. And her descendant, one of her descendants, will come, verse number 15, the seed of the woman, and it shall crush your head. You imagine being Adam and Eve, standing off to the side, covered now with fig leaves, tears running down their face, afraid, standing in the shadows. They've lost that relationship with God, and God comes in the garden, and he begins to speak to the serpent. And he says, I want to tell you that the day will come that because of what you have done, that woman that you deceived, pointing to Eve, that woman that you've deceived, one of her descendants will absolutely crush your head. (laughs) You have to think that Adam and Eve are going, Amen. That's right. And God's going to get you for what you've done. God made the promise in chapter 3, verse number 15. But the mystery, the words are so veiled. They have no idea who this champion will be. God just said a champion would come and would crush Satan. And what you begin to find is that the uh, mysterious, veiled promise of a champion in Genesis chapter number 3, begins to be progressively revealed. That is, his identity begins to be progressively revealed as you move through scriptures. So that before you even get out of the book of Genesis, there's, there's coming this little bits of light that are revealing who the champion is. Here's the way the revelation happens. It happens in the first place when God commands Adam and Eve to begin making sacrifices. And they teach their sons to make sacrifices. And they teach their sons. And suddenly people are coming and offering to God a lamb whose blood will be shed to cover their sins. And with a little pinpoint light, God's pointing to the champion. They don't get it yet. They don't understand it yet. But God in heaven is beginning to illuminate the promise of chapter 3, verse number 15. When you come to Genesis chapter number 11 and 12, God uses a man by the name of Abram, and he calls him, and he says to him, Abram, if you will trust me and follow me, I will give birth to a nation through you, and I will bless the whole world through that nation that will come from you. Abraham doesn't fully understand it. He doesn't get it. But what God is saying is, I'm going to send the champion through you, Abraham, if you'll believe me and follow me. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. God charged and chose Jacob to be the line of Abraham's family through whom he would send the champion. So what did he need to do? He needed to change Jacob's character and his name. So he did that and changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And then the nation of Israel was born. And then Jacob had 12 sons, one of whom was Judah. And the tribe of Judah was chosen. And the promise in obscure terms of Genesis 3.15 begins to unfold as you move through the biblical text. Are you following me? From sacrifices to a man, to his sons, to a nation, to a tribe. And then one day in the line of Judah, there is a king born, who begins as a shepherd, but God says, I'm going to let you shepherd my people. And David comes to the throne, and God says, hey, hey, the champion is coming, and here's how you'll know. He will be a son of David. David's descendant is where the champion will come from. And so the revelation continues to unfold. You move past the time of David, You move into the season of the prophets. Isaiah stands up one day and says, One day the champion will come, and he will not be beautiful, or he will not be noticeable. There will be no beauty in him that you would desire him. He'll look like everybody else, but he will go to the cross, and they will slaughter him like a lamb. He will be the champion. Then you come to the end of the book of Malachi, the end of the Old Testament, and a promise is made that when the champion comes, he will be preceded by a prophet, his prophet, whose name will be like Elijah. And he will lead the way for the champion promised in Genesis 3.15. 
And then you enter into 400 years intertestament period between Malachi and Matthew. 400 years of silence where there's no prophet, no word from heaven, no angel until one day. The promise that had been made in the Old Testament that before the champion came, his prophet would come. One day, there's a man named Zechariah who's a priest in the temple and he's in Jerusalem and he's doing his priestly work in the temple and the angel shows up to him and says, your wife Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And he's going to be an important baby because he's going to herald the arrival of the champion. He's going to tell Israel that their champion is coming. And so Elizabeth conceives John the Baptist who comes forth preaching that the Messiah is coming. And in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Matt Gabriel shows up and speaks to David and speaks to, uh, not David, but Joseph and Mary. And he says to Mary, you are going to give birth to the champion. And then in Luke chapter number 2, you tracking? Luke chapter number 2, the angels show up outside of Bethlehem. They say to the shepherds, for unto you is born this day in the city of David, the champion. What God promised in Genesis 3.15, the Messiah, the champion who will crush the head of Satan, he has been born. And that little champion, looking like every other little Jewish boy, He didn't walk around with a halo over his head. He didn't wear a banner across his chest that said, I am the Messiah. He didn't wear a sign that said, champion, crushing the head of Satan. He looked like every other little boy. He went to Jewish school. He went to synagogue. He went to temple. He went to the Jewish feasts. He looked like every other little boy until he became 29 years old. And God said, it's time. And he went and spent 40 days in the wilderness. And he was tempted of the devil. And after he came down out of the wilderness, he walked down to the Jordan River. And there was the one who would be his prophet, John the Baptist, baptizing in the Jordan River. And Jesus walked down into that river and said, baptize me. And John said, I can't baptize you. You're the champion. You ought to be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, you baptize me. And he put him under the water. And when he came up out of the water, you know what happened? It wasn't obscure anymore. There was no more mystery anymore because heaven opened and God said, that is my beloved son. There's the champion whom I have sent. Jesus came up out of that river and he started walking back up north toward Galilee and he began to heal the lame and and to raise the dead and and to give sight to the blind. John the Baptist said, there he goes. He's the Lamb of God. He's the champion. All the way until he walks into Jerusalem and they're going, Hosanna! The champion is here. Hosanna, the one promised, has come. Until within a few days, those cries turn to crucify him. And suddenly, all the hope of the champion died on a cross outside of Jerusalem when they nailed him to the cross. And even his followers thought that the champion had lost. They didn't understand. In fact, the scripture tells us that two of his disciples, we call them the Emmaus Road disciples. One named Cleopas, another one who's unnamed. They've left Jerusalem after Jesus was crucified, and they're making their way back to Emmaus. It's a a several day walk back up toward the north of Israel in Galilee. They're making their way back. Jesus has risen from the dead, but they don't know it yet. And, and he's, he comes and he begins to walk alongside of him. And they're all depressed. They're just, oh, the champion's dead. We thought it was him. And Jesus comes and hides his identity and walks with them and says, uh, hey, hey, strangers, what you, what you so upset about? Y'all look all downcast. What's the matter? And his own disciples are saying, well, we, didn't you hear what happened? We thought the champion had come. We thought the Messiah had come. And, and, and we thought it was he that was going to be our champion. But they crucified him, and and now he's dead. And Jesus said, oh, you fools and slow of heart. You don't even believe the word of God. And he opened their eyes, and they saw that it was Jesus, and they went, the champion lives. And then they thought, his disciples did, they thought that this would be the moment when the champion would bring in the kingdom. But 40 days later, he ascended back to heaven, and he said, it's not time for the kingdom yet. You go and you spread my gospel and you invite people into my kingdom. And for 2,000 years, that's what we've been doing. And here's what Revelation says about the champion. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, and you can go back to Revelation if you're not there yet. Chapter 1, verse 1, this is the revelation of the champion. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ who is the champion. And he comes and he is king of kings 
and Lord of Lords. And the Bible says in chapter number 22, verse number 16, Jesus says, I am the root and the offspring of David. I'm the promised one. And I'm the bright and morning star, the sun rising to bring in my kingdom. In verse number 20 and 21, I am coming. I am the Lord Jesus. And he says in verse 21, may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you forever. Do you understand the Bible ends where it began, only it began in obscurity with a mysterious promise of a champion. And when you close your Bible, you open it in chapter 3, verse 15, to a, to a mystery. Who will he be that will redeem us and restore for us everything that's lost? And you make your way through the Scriptures. And when you come to the end, you go, oh, I know his name. He's the champion. His name is Jesus. If you understand, be biblical. Say amen. 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 So the champion, there's no question who he is. He's the Lord Jesus. Now, the Revelation also gives us the message. And I want you to write this down. Not just the champion of Revelation, but the message of Revelation. If you were to walk out of here today after 22 weeks of studying this book, and somebody said to you, what does the book of Revelation say? What's the message of Revelation? Would you be able to answer that question? I hope you would. And really, the message of Revelation is, is really not different from the message of the rest of the book. You will find, because it's the last book of the Bible, a sense of urgency in Revelation that gives urgency to the message. Look at verse number 7. Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly. Verse number 12, Behold, I come quickly. Verse number 20, Surely I come quickly. Now, you know this, I've told you this before, that the word quickly doesn't mean right now, it means suddenly, when you don't expect it, in an instant, just like that. Behold, boom, it's done. Jesus has come. So the idea is that the message has greater urgency when I understand that it could come right now, it could be over, that could be the end when he comes. But that's not the message. The message is found in, in chapter 22 in verse number 11, and then verses 14 and 15. And again, it's the, it's the common theme of the entirety of the gospel message. Look at verse number 11. Verse 11 says, He that is unjust will be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous will be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Here's the idea. That in every congregation, in any gathering of people that you have, it's true here this morning without any question, some people in this room are holy and righteous, having been made so by Jesus and his grace. Others in this room are filthy and unrighteous, having rejected the grace of Jesus Christ. There's no in-between. There's no other category. It doesn't matter red, yellow, black, or white. It doesn't matter rich or poor, bond or free, Jew or Greek, the Bible says. It doesn't matter. You are either righteous or unrighteous. This is the message of Revelation. And the urgency of the message is that Jesus is coming in a moment. And when he comes, if you are unrighteous, you will be unrighteous forever. And if you are filthy, you will be lost and in that condition into eternity. And yet if you know Christ, then that will be your blessing throughout eternity. He says it this way in verses number 14 and 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, that they may enter in through the gates of the city. Some people are going to heaven. And verse 15, some people aren't outside of heaven. And he gives this general listing of the, of the uh, characteristics of those who, re, who uh, reject Christ. So some are going to heaven, some aren't going to heaven. Here's the message of Revelation. There's life and death. You're either in life or you're in death. You know, the Bible says this all the way through. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 30, Moses says the same thing, or God does through Moses. Behold, I've set before you life and death. Choose life so that you may live. Now, for those who know Christ as their Savior, chapter 22 gives us a final insight into what life looks like. And we spent a lot of time, as I mentioned earlier, in chapter 21 last week, talking about the glories of heaven. So I just want to mention this quickly because, again, we, we've, talked about, we've talked about heaven a lot. But I want you to notice these two final bits of information in chapter number um, 22. Look with me, first of all, verse number 1. Revelation 22, verse number 1. The Bible says, And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now, I just want to tell you that 
I love the imagery that in heaven, there will be this wonderful crystal clear river that's going to flow. I don't think it's symbolic. I believe that there is, in fact, absolutely a real river of life that flows from the throne of God in heaven. In fact, remember, the Bible ends where it began. And in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, there was a river that flowed through. And so now there's a river in this regained paradise as well. This imagery, though, as real as that is, the imagery, the symbolism of water of life coming from God is throughout the Scriptures. Do you remember Psalm 42, one of my favorite psalms? Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the living God. So over and over, the Scripture presents this this image that if you really want satisfaction, you will find it in Christ. We were singing this earlier. In the world, you'll never find satisfaction, but Jesus is the well that never runs dry. It's what Jesus said to the woman in John chapter 4 who was drawing water for him. And he said, you know, if you knew who I was, you would ask me and I would give you living water. You'd never thirst again. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus said at one of the great high festivals, he said, everybody who's thirsty, come to me. And if you drink of me, then flowing out of your belly, your innermost being, will be rivers of living water. Here's the message. Jesus satisfies forever. In fact, can I just take a quick... uh, Quick survey, get you to agree with this because there might be some people in here who are drinking from all the wells of this world and they're really finding just dust. And if you would say, you know what, I used to do that, but I have now taken a drink from the water of life and Jesus has fully satisfied me, would you tell the other people in this room that it's worth it? Would you just say he satisfies? Would you say amen? He does, doesn't he? 32 years ago, I took a drink of living water. And I want to tell you something, I'm satisfied in Jesus. So the Bible says that we will have this literal river and that it will provide for us satisfaction for all eternity. Now, for you fishermen in the room, I know what you're thinking. There's got to be some trophy trout in that river. But I don't see a word about trout there. I'm sorry to tell you. If you have to fish in heaven to be happy, then maybe God will let you. But we're going to be drinking from that water, not fishing in it. Verse number 2 tells us not only is there a river of life, but there is a tree of life. In fact, verse number 2 says, in the midst of the street of it, next to the river of life, and on either side of the river, there was a tree of life which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So there's a river of life in heaven, and then there's this tree, the tree of life, an actual tree, we believe it's a literal tree uh, in heaven, that we will eat from for eternity. Now, this is not the first time that you see the tree of life in heaven. In fact, the Bible ends where it begins. Go back to Genesis. Hold your finger in Revelation again. Go very quickly to Genesis chapter number 2. Let me show you the tree of life there as well. Genesis chapter 2, verse number 9. The Bible says, And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Now, as far as I know, that means every tree that we can imagine. The garden was full of wonderful food and fruit. So, I don't know, apple trees, banana trees, um, orange trees, lemon trees, apricot, I don't know, all kinds of trees. All right? So, all these trees in the garden, every tree that you can imagine. And, the Bible says in verse number 9, and there was there the tree of life. It was there. And the clear implication is that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of life. And that the tree of life in the garden had the same effect on them as it will have on us forever in heaven. And then verse number 9, there was in that garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skip up to verse number 16. Chapter 2, verse 16. The Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. You want an apple? Go get an apple. Help yourself. No prohibition. You want a banana? Go get a perfect banana. You you want uh, whatever. You, you, You want something? Go get it. You're surrounded by it. But, verse 17, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. From the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. One prohibition, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, they did, as we learned. And if you go to the end of chapter 3, look with me at verse number 22. Genesis 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, 
Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way of the tree of life. Here's the implication. The implication is that the, the Adam and Eve were banned from the garden, not simply because they were now separate from God, but in order to guard, to keep them from the tree of life. So in the garden you had this tree, it was available to them until they fell, and then it was no longer available. Well, you move through the biblical narrative, you find the redemption that Jesus brings, you come to the end of the Bible, chapter 22 of Revelation, and suddenly we're now in paradise again, we are with the Lord, and look what is there for us to eat from forever, there it is again, no longer banned, but restored to us through His grace, the tree of life. Now, verse number 2 says it bears all kinds of fruit. I don't know what kinds of fruit that is. The Bible doesn't say. It would be speculation, so there's no reason to do it. But 12 different kinds of fruit, and it bears a harvest perpetually every single month. And I love that the Bible says in verse number 2 that the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, don't misunderstand this. Someone read that once, and they said to me, does that mean we'll get sick in heaven? So, like, I need to, if I'm sick, I go over to the tree of life, and I... And I get healed by the the, the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. Now, here's the idea. The Greek word that's translated here is a word which means therapeutic. Not healing in the sense of I'm sick and I need to be made better. But that therapeutic therapy that gives us uh, eternal and robust health. The leaves of the the, uh, tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, if y'all still with me, say amen. One last thing to note, and then we're going to wrap up. And that is that I find it interesting that the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden, and Adam and Eve obviously partook of that. The leaves were for them, for their healing, for their, for their robust health until the day that they fell. And what was the first thing that Adam and Eve did the moment they sinned? They knew that they were naked, and the first thing they did was that they grabbed leaves, and they sewed together aprons to cover their nakedness. The leaves of the tree of life had provided them for all of the time that they had been in the garden with perfect health and covering and a relationship with God. And the moment they fell, they tried to find something to replace what they had lost. So they started grabbing leaves to cover themselves. Here's the message of Revelation. Stop sewing together leaves to cover yourself. Some of you have sewn together a beautiful apron of religious behavior and you have everybody around you fooled by your religion to thinking that you have a right relationship with God. And the message of Revelation is get those leaves off. They're ineffective. He has provided the healing that you need through His grace. You have sewn together a a diary of, of leaves on which you list your excuses for not coming to Christ. You've sewn together shrouds of indifference to the gospel. Lay all that aside because the champion has come to give you life forever. So you have the champion of Revelation. You have the message of Revelation. The tree of life, the water of life will be there. Then lastly, you find in this chapter the messengers of Revelation. This may be the most important thing I'll say to you today. The messengers of of Revelation. Would you go to chapter number 22, Revelation 22, look at verse number 16. Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify of these things in the churches. Let me ask you a question. If you're listening, say amen. Who is the message of Revelation for? If you read chapter number 1 of Revelation, verse 11, I think, Jesus commands John, the things that you see, write in a book and send it to the whole world. No, that's not what he says. The things that you see, write in a book and send it to the churches. Loved ones, I want you to hear me. If you haven't heard anything else I've said in 22 weeks, I want you to hear this. The message of Revelation is for the church. And if you look at the next verse, verse number 17, having received the message of revelation, we are now to become the messengers of grace. Verse 17, and the Spirit through the bride says come. 
Those who have heard say come. And let those who are thirsty come and drink of the water of life freely. In just a few minutes, you're going to close your Bible. And you're going to close 22 weeks of study in the book of Revelation. And I have a question for you. What are you going to do with what you now know? Somebody said to me last week after the noon service, a guy said to me, Pastor, I want to tell you something. I get it now. I get it. I understand it. Here's my question for you. If you understand the book of Revelation today better than you've ever understood it in your life after we've walked through it together, what will you do with what you know? Because God didn't give you the book of Revelation so that you could say, I got it. God gave you the book of Revelation so that you could say verse number 17. Hey, everybody that's thirsty, there's water of life. Come and take a drink.